So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the Learn from the Legends series, an international bi-monthly webinar series organized by NNF Kerala and IAP New Chap. Today we have a legend from Spain to enlighten us on a great uh, topic. It is oxygenation of the fetus and the newborn. And the speaker is none other than Professor Maximo Vendo, the Chief of Division of Neonatology, University and Polytechnic Hospital, La Fe Valencia, Spain and the scientific director, Health Research Institute, La Fe Valencia, Spain. And today, our moderators will be two eminent neonatologists of India, Dr. Hariram and Dr. Nalini Khan Panigra. So it's going to be a great scientific feast for all those who are attending this session from all over the globe. I welcome Professor Maximo Vendo to start his proceedings after the introduction by Dr. V.C. Manoj. Over to you, Manoj. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Hearty welcome to another session of our Learn from the Legends. And today we are so proud to present you one of the greatest legends of neonatology we have, uh, the Professor Maximo Vento. All of us have started learning neonatology hearing this name, this great name. He has been introduced as a Professor of Pediatrics, Chief of Division of Neonatology at University and Polytechnic Hospital, Spain. I would go much beyond that. He is a true legend in all the words, all, uh, always. He is the chairman of the European Board of Neonatology, member of the Executive Committee of the European Society for Pediatric Research, ex-president of the Spanish Neonatal Society, chairman of the Spanish Maternal Neonatal and Developmental Network, uh, chairman of the platform for the development of clinical trials in the Health Research Institute La Fe Valencia, Spain. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> and the designations go on and on. He has a very lines of interest right from the, uh, the topic that we are going to hear today. His line of interest stretches all over and I'm really amazed to and really I feel fortunate to introduce this legend to this August o o gathering. Physiology of the fetal to neonatal transmission, his research runs perinatal asphyxia, restoration to delivery room, oxygen physiology, hypoxia, hyperoxia, dry toxicity, oxidative nitro nitrosative uh, stress, biomarkers, epigenetics and oxygen, redox regulation, microbiome, infection, genome wide expression, methodology, various aspects like targeted and untargeted metabolomics. HPLC or GC coupled to mass spectrometry, LC, QT, Q, OF approach, capillary, electrophoresis. His areas of research where he has done commentable work go on and on. So, and he has a large amount of published literature in the international peer-reviewed journals. So if I go on like this, I would be standing between you and the great legend. So let me... Uh, wind up the introduction and proudly introduce the great one of the greatest legends of today professor maximo vento over to you professor max uh, thank you very much for this i would say excessive introduction that you have done i am very proud and very happy to be here with all of you and uh, uh, i am i'm very very thankful to the organizers for inviting me to spend this time with you I am going to share my, my screen and start with my presentation. I hope all of you can hear me and you can see the presentation. Yes, sir. Okay, so we are going to talk today about oxygen, the fetus and newborn, a comprehensive approach. 
First of all, I would like to do to devote some minutes to oxygen metabolism and oxidative stress because the relevance of oxygen it's, uh, it regards the uh, its metabolism as a supplier of high energy to multicellular organisms, but on the contrary, it has also a drawback with the oxidative stress that it causes that can cause damage at any age, but especially in preterm infants. Oxygen metabolism and oxidative stress uh, and nitrosive stress will be my first approach. Then uh, damage to DNA, epidemiologic association and oxygen load. So would you know, and all of you know from basic biochemistry that aerobic metabolism is 18 to 20 times more energy efficient than anaerobic metabolism. Hence, if we're breathing air, which contains 21% oxygen, every mole of glucose that we are in ingesting, it's going to wind up creating 36 moles of ATP. However, if you are taking one mole of glucose and you would be without oxygen in an anaerobic meta uh, metabolism, then you would only, only put forward four moles of ATP. Multicellular organisms like the human body require a great amount of energy for growth and development. And the uh, amount of energy required is, and this is very important, tissue dependent. Not all the tissues behave the same. For example, the brain. The brain has a huge metabolic rate. It has a high transmembrane potential. Most of the energy that the brain receives is spent keeping the high transmembrane potential in order to keep sodium outside the neurons and uh, potassium inside, and also to do the neurotransmission of the different types of, uh, of, of potentials. And the lack of energy causes an accumulation of substrates, as you know, happens, for example, in asphyxia. Well, if you don't have oxygen and you are only producing four moles of ATP, you are not going to meet the requirements of, of, of brain in order to achieve its uh, potential of uh, metabolism. So you will have an alteration of the delta of intra, cell, intra and extracellular ion pumps. So you will get sodium inside the cell, sodium inside the neurons, with swelling of the cells, leading probably to, to necrosis, and you will have a, you will be you will you will not be able to re rebuild and recycle all the excitatory amino acids that you have in the synaptic cleft, and the excitatory amino acids will uh, accumulate in the synaptic cleft and lead to a hyper excitative excitatory a stimulus of the postsynaptic uh, uh, neurons, and you are going to cause the cell of, uh, the death of these neurons. So what happens when you are uh, getting nutrients finally, and you, get, uh, you are in the presence of oxygen? Here you have a very simple scheme of what happens. Imagine where nutrients is glucose, glucose enters as acetyl coenzyme A into the, into the mitochondria, and goes through the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is going to liberate, to liberate high energy electrons, high energy electrons that are going to be transported by specific transporters, flavine adenine dinucleotide and nicotine adenine dinucleotide. They are going to be transported to the different components of the, uh, of the electronic transport chain. This electronic transport chain is made up by different proteins that transfer the electrons one to the next one in an orderly manner. And in this transport from one of the, one of the components to the next one, the, this uh, energy is liberated in the form of extruded protons. In the form of extruded protons, it's going to be recaptured by the fifth component of the electron transport chain, 
And this energy that is recaptured is going to lead to the formation of ATP. Meanwhile, every mole of oxygen is going to capture four electrons in the outer shell. And this is the way that oxygen neutralizes high energy electrons and impedes that these electrons are going to damage the mitochondrial structure. So what we see in, in the physiology, in the normal molecular uh, metabolism of oxygen is that we have a four step reduction. So you, the, the, by the dioxygen captures four electrons, one, two, three, and four. And by doing so, it completes its outer shell and combined with two protons, give rise to water. And this is a normal, normal transitional metabolic, metabolic and reaction that doesn't produce any harm to our, organ, to our organism. However, under physiologic conditions, 2% of the oxygen is, going, is not going to be completely reducted. And under pathologic conditions, such as hyperoxia or hypoxia reoxygenation, the percentage of oxygen that is not completely reduced can be much bigger, 10, 20, 30%. What happens when you are only reducing stepwise oxygen? If oxygen is reduced only by one electron, then you are going to have the generation of superoxide. Superoxide is a, a free radical, a reactive oxygen species that tends to, tends to combine with nitric oxide, giving rise to a very, very aggressive molecule that is peroxynitride. This molecule is going to damage cellular structures. However, under normal conditions, we, we will have superoxide dismutase and superoxide dismutase is going to reduce superoxide with another electron into hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a reactive oxygen species, but it's not a free radical. It's not going to be to cause any harm directly. However, however, hydrogen peroxide is a signaling molecule that is going to regulate many functions of the cell. But in the presence, in the presence of free transition metals like iron, copper, manganese, it's going to give rise to phantom chemistry. And phantom chemistry in Haberweiss reaction are going to, to give rise to the formation of hydroxyl radical, which is the most aggressive free radical that we have in, the, in our organism. And it's going to cause a lot of damage to the nucleus, to DNA, to proteins, enzymatic proteins, structural proteins, to lipids, and also to carbohydrates. Moreover, hydrogen peroxide can also get reduced by a third electron and give rise to hydroxyl radicals. So you can get hydroxyl radicals by two ways. And finally, if you reduce oxygen with four molecules, as I told you of four electrons, excuse me, as I told you at the beginning, you are going to have water and this is an, an, a neutral, neutral reaction. So what do we have so? You have that under normal conditions, 2% of oxygen is going to give rat, rise to free radicals. And under pathologic conditions, this percentage can go up until 10, 20 or 30%. And these free radicals are going to damage DNA causing mutations and mutations, some of them can perpetuate, especially because preterm, preterm infants don't have uh, the mature uh, repair systems, DNA repair systems, the glycosylases, which repair DNA are less expressed in preterm babies than in new, uh, term babies or in adults. It's going to cause damage to the enzymes in the cells and also to the structural proteins, altering their function and their structure. And it's going to give them and cause damage to lipids, especially those lipids who are in the membranes. You know that membranes of the cells have a bilayer of, of lipids 
And if you destroy the lipids, you are destroying also all the receptors that are the hundreds and hundreds of receptors that have the surface of the cells. And then all the function of the cells get altered and it's going to cause the inactivation of the cell. Here you have, we have recently done a series of studies with a mice model of a, of a, a, of pregnant, pregnant uh, mice who gave birth to small uh, offsprings that were born at 14% or at 21%. And when we, when we uh, gave these uh, mice, we put them in 100% oxygen, those mice that had been in 14%, so we had done a preconditioning in hypoxia, were capable of resisting better the, uh, the burst of 100% oxygen. You see here, the, this is a control, 21%, and here you have a hyperoxic, a destroyed, completely destroyed mitochondria. So this is very important that you remember that preconditioning is a good measure to uh, avoid damage to mitochondria. In order to avoid the damage that uh, free radicals cause in our organism, we have non-enzymatic antioxidants. We have uh, the most of them are low molecular mass antioxidants, and the most relevant is glutathione, the first one. Glutathione, reduced glutathione is going to give two electrons to oxygen and neutralize it. But we have also others like thioredoxin, ascorbic acid, and vitamin A, uric acid, or cysteine and cysteine. We have also the possibilities of sequestration of transition metals in order to avoid the uh, Fenton reaction. You remember that I told you that in the presence of iron or, or manganese or zinc or selenium, these uh, metals are going to stimulate the creation of free radicals. If we sequester these transition metals with, for example, ferritin or transferrin or bilirubin, or celluloplasmin, then we are going to impede that these, free, that these metals are free and that they induce free radicals. And by physical quenching, which is the cause of vitamin A, vitamin A. But we have also enzymatic antioxidants. Enzymatic antioxidants, the most relevant or better known are superoxide dismutases. We have one which is a, a, in the cytoplasm, and we have also another one, man manganese superoxide dismutase, which is in the nucleus, in the mitochondria. Uh, and then we have extracellular superoxide dismutase. But we have also others like catalyses, glutathione peroxidases, peroxyredoxin and glutaredoxin, which are going to reduce a hydrogen peroxide. You see that when we are in a situation where oxidative stress is increasing, you see here that this mitochondria, because we are in a hyperoxic condition or we are in hypoxia, but we are recovering this baby in the delivery room with high oxygen concentrations, is going to liberate these free radicals. When the amount of free radicals increases, KIP1 liberates NRF2. NRF2 is going to translocate into the nucleus and get binded to DNA to a very specific region. The specific region is the antioxidant responsive element. So when they both bind, then there is an activation of the genes that express all these antioxidant enzymes that I told you before. And these are going to act upon the mitochondria and neutralize the production of free radicals. What we are seeking is a balance between reducing state where GSH, thioredoxin, and cysteine are highly concentrated against the oxidating stage, state where, oxidate, uh, where oxidated uh, glutathione, oxidated thioredoxin, and cysteine are predominant. So in this balance is how life usually evolves. And this balance is necessary for cell to develop and to have a normal metabolism to divide and to, and to get divided 
and to reproduce. However, in the preterm babies, due to uh, several factors, like is the immaturity of the lungs that are necessary to give uh, oxygen, the immaturity of the repair mechanisms of DNA, the, rem the, the immaturity of the antioxidant enzyme system, all these mechanisms are going to make that uh, preterm babies, especially very preterm ba babies, are preterm to be in an oxidizing state. So they are going to have more facility to have DNA damage, proteins, enzymes, cell membranes, etc. So how is oxygen in the fetal life? Well, if you see this study by Dr. Schneider, that uh, he measured the intervillous oxygen tension. You know that through the intervillous space is where the mother uh, uh, shares the oxygen uh, with the fetus. So there is a, a, a passage of oxygen without any receptors or without any transporters, just by the difference of concentration. And the, depending on the amount of oxygen that the maternal side has, the baby is going to have a higher or a lower oxygen concentration. You see here how it happens. You see here that during the first eight to 10 weeks in the embryo embryological state, the partial pressure of oxygen is relatively low, between 20 and 30 millimeters of mercury. If you would increase the oxygen content in this space, in this period, to 60, 70, or 80, then you would have probably abortions. Afterwards, afterwards, in the second stage, between the 10 and 12 or 14th week, when the placentation starts to occur, suddenly the amount of oxygen increases. And at the end of pregnancy, when the placenta is mature, the oxygen reaches around 50 to 60 uh, as a median. And this is the amount of oxygen that is uh, in the fetus uh, at the end of gestation. You will ask yourself how having such a low oxygen concentration, the fetus can grow so rapidly and the fetus can have their tissues adequately oxygenated. Well, the first thing is that fetal hemoglobin has more affinity for oxygen than adult type of uh, hemoglobin. And it liberates a better, with a better pace, oxygen in the periphery than does adult hemoglobin. And moreover, the, the combined ventricular output of the fetus is 400 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is substantially substantially greater than the adult ventricular output. We, the fetus has a much higher uh, hemoglobin content and they have 100% fetal hemoglobin. For these reasons is why fetus, despite having, despite having a lower oxygen content in the blood, they are able to grow and to have a normal metabolism. However, what happens if you ox administer oxygen to the mother? Well, you see here fetal PO2 and you see here maternal arterial PO2. When uh, obstetricians give oxygen to the mother in C-sections or just because they believe that giving oxygen, it will, uh, it will uh, improve the oxygenation state of the fetus, you are increasing the amount of oxygen in the arterial and in the umbilical vein. Moreover, if you measure malondehaldehyde, which is uh, um, derived from the peroxidation of lipids in maternal, in the, in the mother, you will see that when you increase oxygenation, you are going to increase the amount of malondehaldehyde. You are going to cause an oxidative stress to the mother. But moreover, if we measure eight isoprosteins, which are per, uh, peroxidative derivatives of lipid peroxidation uh, in the fetus, 
you see that as maternal arterial PO2 increases, you will have more and more amounts, which is a high, you see is highly significant, more amount of umbilical venous vein eight isoprosteins. So you are causing also an oxidative stress to the fetus. And if you cause an oxidative stress to the fetus, postnatal adaptation is going to be planted. In this study that we performed with a group of obstetricians from Finland, from the University of Helsinki, what we saw is that when the fetus is hypoxic, and we are talking now about hypoxia, as happens in diabetic pregnancies, we see that when the fetus gets more and more hypoxic, the amount of EPO, erythropoietin, in the amniotic fluid increases exponentially. So we can see, we can, we can uh, monitor the status of hypoxia in the fetus by doing determinations of erythropoietin in the amniotic fluid. However, what hasn't been done before and we did for the first time in 12, 2012 is that we measured the correlation between hypoxia, between the amount of EPO you see here in, in logarithmic scale with metatyrosine. Metatyrosine is an oxidative terabyte from proteins. And this was a highly significant amount of metatyrosine when the fetus got more and more hypoxic. Moreover, when we analyzed 8-oxodehydroguanosine, which is a measure of damage to DNA, we saw that the more hypoxic the fetus was, the more consistent was the diabetes and the more the preeclampsia, then more damage to fetal DNA we got. This was correlated with the uh, finding of hypoglycemia in the fetus. When in the fetus was born, babies with high EPO and high oxidative damage, they had higher hypoglycemia. They were admitted more frequently in the NICU. They had more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they had more hyperbilirubinemia. The second part of my presentation is going to deal with the oxygenation in the fetal to neonatal transition. Well, you have a normal delivery. We have already spoken about the low oxygen environment in utero. And abruptly, the fetus is born and suddenly he starts breathing and there is a massive increase of oxygen in the circulation. So during fetal to neonatal transition, we have an abrupt increase of oxygen, which will lead undoubtedly to the generation of oxidative stress. Anion superoxide, hydroxyl radical, nitric oxide, peroxynitrate, etc. These are one of them, but we have many others. We can have a normoxia, a normal situation. So we will have a physiologic oxidative stress, and these free radicals are going to activate activate metabolic pathways, which are normal for the adaptation of the baby after birth. But we can have here on the left, a situation of hypoxia. Profound hypoxia is going to give rise to hypoxemia and bradycardia. And this is going to lead to intraperiventricular hemorrhage or mortality. Or we can have a situation of hyperoxia because the baby is resuscitated with large amounts of oxygen. And this is going to cause oxidative stress, which will have short and long-term consequences. In 2009, we published this paper in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And we studied the activity of superoxide dismutase in very preterm babies below 28 weeks of gestation. And we saw that it was compared with normal babies born at term, preterm babies had a much lower 
antioxidant capacity. You see here in umbilical cord and in day one. However, babies who received antenatal steroids, as you see here in the white histogram, had a significant increase in the activity and were, were defended better against free radicals. And the same happens to catalyze activity. So what we saw is that babies who are preterm have less antioxidant enzyme activity, but babies who are preterm but receive their mothers received antenatal steroids are in a better situation to fight against free radicals. And girls had a, a maturity that was about 10 to 12 days greater than a preterm babies who were males. So we were worried about how we should administer oxygen to these babies. Because we know the damage that hypoxia causes, we know the damage that hyperoxia causes, and we know that babies need some oxygen to start breathing and to, and to uh, have a normal metabolism. So together with uh, other uh, groups, we tried to put forward a nomogram. Our first study was done in 2003, and we were measuring during transition serial serial measurements of arterial blood in order to see the kilopascals, the partial pressure of oxygen. And as you see in utero, we had three to, three to 3.5 kilopascals, which is around 30, 35% millimeters of mercury in arterial, in arterial blood. But suddenly in transition, this uh, partial pressure of oxygen increased exponentially and reached around seven to eight kilopascals, which is around 60 to 70% millimeters of mercury. And then it stayed quite stable. Uh, it plateaued in during the neonatal transition. So we uh, were speaking with uh, the group of Dr. Peter Davis and Colin Morley in Australia that had the same thought as we had. Let's get, let's get a, a sufficient amount of babies that don't need resuscitation, that don't receive oxygen in the delivery room. Let's monitor minute by minute the, the, PAO, the SpO2 and the heart rate predictably, so we can measure it in brain. And let's see how these babies adapt after, after birth. So we gathered a total of 468 babies. 34% were preterm babies, less than 36, 37 weeks of gestation, and 308 were term babies, 37 to 42 weeks. None of these babies received positive pressure ventilation and received oxygen. Here you have the reference ranges that were published in pediatrics and is one of the most cited papers in neonatology. And what we see is that practically preterm babies, not, not uh, mostly late preterm, I would say that this, this nomogram was mainly done with late preterm babies, 34, 35 weeks of gestation, and term babies need approximately uh, between three and four minutes to reach a median of 85% uh, oxygen. Here you have the median. That doesn't mean that there are some babies who are normal that need around eight to eight, nine minutes to reach the same. And other preterm babies, they need all, almost the same time. So this was for the first time, it discovered that APGAR score at one minute cannot have in color two points because there isn't almost no baby has a pink color when he is born because he needs at least two to three minutes in order to get oxygenated. So the normal APGAR score should be between eight and nine. But this was the first, our first discovery. And then the second is that if the heart rate was doing well, if the baby had more than 100 beats per minute and the oxygen was slowly increasing minute by minute without resuscitation, these babies didn't need to get positive pressure ventilation. Because if you did that 
you could give oxygen, you could cause hyperoxia, which causes damage to the baby, and you could blunt the normal physiological response of the chemo uh, of the chemoreceptors in the carotid in the carotid bodies who respond to low oxygen concentrations, activating breathing. So you would stop breathing and you would need more time to recover these babies. However, we have recently published several, uh, a couple of months ago in, in late 2020, you can have, uh, you have this, this paper in, in Journal of Pediatrics. What we did is we did a similar study as we did in 2010 with Jennifer Dawson. We did it in our hospital with around 300 babies but we compared delayed versus immediate cord clamping to see if the blood that we are receiving in the first minutes after birth, when you are not clamping the cord, changes the nomogram of saturation. So we wanted to establish a new reference range for new, newborn babies with delayed cord clamping that was more than 60 seconds after birth. Babies were all greater or equal to 37 weeks of gestation after an uneventful, uneventful pregnancy and delivery. Delayed cord clamping, the median was 110 seconds. We put the pulse oximeter in the right palm or wrist, and we monitored with two seconds measurements and maximum intensity, SpO2 and heart rate. And we put the baby at the end and prone position on the mother's chest to do skin-to-skin -skin contact. Here you have the graph. And you see, you remember before, this was the graph that I showed you before in 2010. Babies needed more than three minutes. If you leave court, uh, uh, court uh, um, uh, with, with, without clamping, when you permit uh, in that blood continues to flow through the cord, then you need only 1.8 minutes in order to achieve 85%. So more than less than two minutes time, you achieve the same saturation that you, are, you achieve when you are clamping the cord. So babies with, with delayed cord clamping achieve higher saturations of oxygen earlier. The second thing is that when you are dealing with babies with cord clamping, you have the first measurements you see in black of the heart rate are quite low. And it is not until two or three minutes, mostly three minutes is the median or, uh, go by that you have a stable heart rate of around 160. However, if you leave the cord patent and you receive the transfusion from your mother, then your heart rate doesn't go down. It's kept around 140, 140, 150, but it doesn't vary. So there isn't this early, uh, early uh, in the early period after birth, babies with cord clamp, they have an empty ventricular uh, uh, output because they are receiving less blood for a couple of minutes and they have to contract their heart with low, a low cardiac output and a low, and, and, and a low uh, re a reception of blood. However, if you uh, leave the cord patent, then you are receiving blood all the time you are expanding your lungs, you are opening your arteries, and then the blood coming from the placenta is going directly through the lungs into the, into the uh, right and the left heart. And so you are pumping with full uh, cardiac output. The third point would be oxygen supplementation in resuscitation and stabilization of newly born infants. You know this graph, in 2008, we showed that when you are uh, ventilating asphyxiated babies, you are giving room air, you are reducing mortality significantly. 
So from then on, it was accepted that uh, in 2010, the ILCOR guidelines recommended that it is best to begin with air rather than 100% oxygen. And here you have Dr. Ramji, Dr. Saustad, and myself, a little younger than I am now, that uh, uh, we were the first to show this in a series of clinical studies. But what about preterm infants and what are we studying now? Well, you can initiate ventilation in the delivery room with 21%, 30%, 60%, 100%. What is best? These studies were done by our group in the upper side. Uh, these studies were done uh, in 2008 and 2009, and we compare 30 versus 90 percent oxygen as initial FiO2. And what you see is that we didn't find really differences. We saw a little difference in the group of 30% regarding SpO2 saturation, but it wasn't really striking. However, at the same time, Dr. Feiner in, in San Diego, in California, compared room air versus 100%. So this was three times more oxygen and this was five times more oxygen. Babies with room air didn't really uh, uh, have a normal heart rate until they achieved three to four minutes. So they were bradycardic for two, three minutes. And this period of bradycardia is important. And the babies with room air, very preterm babies, less than 28 weeks gestation, were with hypoxemia and bradycardia for several minutes. You see here that babies didn't read 80% until they were six to seven minutes after birth. So they were around five minutes, the first five minutes, with I have recently published a paper, which are the most relevant minutes in the postnatal adaptation. They were not able to achieve this high, this uh, target saturation of 80 to 85. This was proven by Dr. A. Oe in Sydney. It was proven in a multicenter trial, multicenter multinational trial called the torpedo trial, in which she also compared 21 versus 100, and she monitored SpO2 in the first 10 minutes. When you see the babies, the most small babies, more premature babies, this happens the same as Dr. Feiner had said 10 years before. They were bradycardic, but they were hypoxemic almost until seven to eight minutes. So they didn't reach 85% until eight to nine minutes. This was a long period of bradycardia. Babies above 99, uh, 29 weeks, they were also hypoxemic, but they were less time hypoxemic and not so hypoxemic. When they did a uh, post hoc analysis of their results, what they saw is that babies below 28 weeks of gestation, 22% of these babies that had received room air died, compared to only 6% of babies that has re had received an initial 100% oxygen. Remember that the oxygen was afterwards titrated according to the response. So there was almost a four times more risk of dying in very preterm babies that receive an initial uh, concentrations of 21% because they needed more time to achieve a target saturation of 80 to 85. We did a meta-analysis to analyze these results. And what we saw is that babies less than 28 weeks of gestation less than 28 weeks of gestation. If you are starting with, with more, with 30% or around 30% oxygen, which is called low oxygen, and you compare these babies with babies who are receiving 90 or 100, you don't see any differences in mortality. What is the question? The question is not, that you are starting with higher or lower oxygen is that the question is if you achieve a targeted saturation of 80 or 85 percent 
with a normal heart rate of more than 100. And this is the important. However, the probability of reaching these higher saturations is better if you start with higher oxygen concentrations. We didn't find any differences in the secondary outcomes. So now comes the important. So our, our hypothesis was that preterm babies, regardless of starting FiO2, who did not reach an SpO2 of 85% at five minutes, were at a high, higher risk of death or major interventricular hemorrhage. This was an individual patient study. We included eight randomized controlled trials that compared lower initial FiO2, which is uh, less or equal to 30%, versus higher initial FiO2, which was, was greater than 65%. The babies were categorized according to five minutes SpO2 in those who met the guidelines, those who met the study SpO2, and those who overshot, eh, who achieved more than 85%. You have to think that out of all this amount of babies, which were 706 babies studied, 50% did not meet the required SpO2, which means that half of the babies that we resuscitate between eight, between uh, below eight, 28 weeks of gestation don't reach 85% at five minutes. And the factor, the factor that influences the most is the gestational age. Babies of 24, 25, 26 weeks have it more, much more difficult to reach the saturation and the FiO2, babies who are below 30% have more difficulties to reach. And when you combine both lower gestational ages with lower initial FiO2, then it's a, a, a huge amount of babies don't achieve this saturation. However, 29% of the babies overshoot, which is 30%, which one third, which is important because damage caused by hyperoxia. And the most important factor was starting with higher oxygen. So we would recommend in very low birth weight infants, starting with FiO2s higher than usual between 30 and 40 or 40 and 50, but especially to titrate rapidly if you don't achieve a saturation of 80 at three minutes and 85 at five minutes, and especially if this is combined with lower saturations, lower uh, uh, heart rates. So when we adjusted our results, uh, uh, we did an adjusted OCH ratio for death or IVH. We saw that babies who didn't reach a heart rate of 100 beats per minute at five minutes died 4.2 times more frequently and babies who didn't reach a saturation of 80% had 4.5 times more IVH. The same study, the, the, the most recent Cochrane review was in 2018, and they also found that in general, if you compare less than 0.4 versus higher than 0.4, you don't see differences in mortality. However, if you go baby by baby and you see uh, which were more frequently having uh, problems. These were babies that were very preterm and who started with uh, the lowest FiO2. And this was uh, uh, the same study, the Conqueror Review, who analyzed two of our studies and didn't find any differences in the Bailey 3 developmental scoring system. We published this paper in pediatrics in 2016. And the same study was a consensus on science with treatment recommendation done by Michelle uh, Wellsford. And what she saw is that the um, studies with low risk of bias, we didn't see any differences between preterm with low FiO2 and preterm with high FiO2. And there was a high risk of bias 
a mortality short term randomized control at high, high risk of bias, then you see that there was a, a, a also there weren't any differences. Here in the low risk of bias, which are studies that are uh, randomized control trials done in university hospitals with a team of experts, you, uh, you find better results or even better results, even if you start with lower FiO2. So what we think now is it's not the initial FiO2, it's what I told you before, it's titration, titration and keeping heart rate above 100. So they didn't, they, they concluded that short-term mortality was in difference, long-term mortality was in difference, and long-term neurodevelopmental impairment was in difference. To end up, I will present you the Brady Prem study that was led by Dr. Vishal Kapadia in Texas and has been published a couple of months ago in resuscitation. And this is a multicenter trial a multicenter multinational, and is based on the on the motto that heart rate is the most vital of vital signs. And we know that heart rate and respiration are the most employed vital signs to assess response to resuscitation. And the incidence of bradycardia in preterm infants in the delivery room is unknown. We don't know. And there is an and we suppose that there is an association between bradycardia, prolonged bradycardia and mortality and morbidity in the delivery room and in the NICU. And we also hypothesized that there was an interaction between prolonged bradycardia and low SpO2 in the delivery room. So we, we took a series of studies, uh, we eligible studies, and we were babies, preterm babies, and we had monitored in all these studies, minute by minute, heart rate, SpO2, and initial FiO2, and we also had a, a, a retrieved complications. And a, all these a, babies were divided in three groups. Those who didn't have bradycardia, during the 10 first minutes, no registered heart rate was below 100 beats per minute. Those we considered to have transient bradycardia, heart rate was less than 100 beats per minute for less or equal to one minute. And we considered prolonged bradycardia, those who had a heart rate below 100 beats per minute for more or equal to, uh, to two minutes. And we adjusted confounding variables uh, for gestational age, gender, birth weight, antenatal steroids, etc. So out of a total of 535 patients, we had 205, 40% who didn't show bradycardia at all, 115, 22% had transient bradycardia. And, and this is very important, 40% of these babies had a prolonged bradycardia, more than two minutes below 100 during the first 10 minutes after birth. And gestational age and birth weight were striking matters, striking factors influencing these results and SpO2, not reaching SpO2 of 80%, less than having an SpO2 of less than 80% at five minutes was also an, an, uh, an important factor. So in babies, in babies who didn't have bradycardias, mortality was 3%, IVH 3% and death or IVH 6%. However, in babies who had prolonged bradycardia, more than two minutes, you had five times more death, four times more IVH, and four times more death or IVH, all highly significant. If you combine here, you see saturation less than 80 blue at five minutes and prolonged bradycardia, you see how the bar is the highest one representing 18%. So we conclude that no differences in mortality and or severe or long-term consequences between using higher or lower initial FiO2, initially. 
Very potent infants in the lower group need more frequently oxygen supplementation to achieve targeted SpO2. So the important thing is if, if you are starting with high oxygen, let's say 70 or 80, you have to titrate down in the first minutes in order to avoid hyperoxia. But if you start with 30%, then you have to increase FiO2 in order to achieve at three minutes at least 80 and at five minutes at least 85. So titration is very important. Most studies show that preterm infants need an FiO2 of 0.4 to 0.6 at three to five minutes to achieve an SpO2 of 80 to 85. This is important too. So that's the limits. It, when you start up, you go down to 0 0.5 and you, when, when you start down, you go up to 0 0.52. Achieving saturations of 80 to 85% between three to five minutes and keeping heart rate above 100% beats per minute reflect a good stabilization process. Not achieving these targets predicts higher mortality and or IVH. And here you have a picture of my research group. Uh, some people from the lab are missing, but these are more clinicians. And I would uh, be ready to uh, answer any of your questions in the expectancy that my presentation has been enjoyed by all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, in June uh, 2020, Professor Ola Soxterd uh, inaugurated our Learn from the Legends webinar series with a talk on oxygenation and of the newborn. And one year and four months since then, the concepts of oxygenation do not cease to amaze us. It was an excellent journey. Thank you so much, Professor Maximo Vento. Sir, uh, as usual, a talk, sir, so, so very good. Now, we have a, in a discussion uh, se section coming up. I invite two esteemed neonatologists of the country, Dr. Hariram and Dr. Nalini Kant, to moderate the discussion session. Over to you, moderators. Thank you very much, Max, for your uh, very elegant and very clear-cut presentation. Thank you. You took us through the physiology of oxygenation, oxygenation of the fetus, transition, and the newborn period. Thank you very much for Thank your you. Thank presentation. You. Max will be happy to answer questions. Yeah, I will be very happy to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, we already have questions in the Q&A box, so we can yeah. start with that. We, can we have start. a question from uh, Parbati Chaliha. Does height influence oxygenation of fetus? Say, for example, in places like uh, Tawang, at a height of 16,000 feet above the sea level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the, I, I was explaining how uh, the fetus adapts to low oxygen. Uh, under normal conditions, increasing the, the cardiac output and with fetal hemoglobin. When you are, when you are, a, a, when the pregnant woman is a high altitude, what happens is that the baby adapts itself also and has a higher a, a amount of red cells and it has a, a higher capacity of capturing the small amount of oxygen that the mother can transfer. So the only difference that we see in these cases is a smaller, a, a, a smaller weight, but we don't see problems with oxygen. The problem would happen if this woman would, would be having the pregnancy at sea level and she would have delivery at 5,000 meters altitude. Under these circumstances, the baby would probably have a pulmonary hypertension and would have the need for receiving oxygen. Thank you, Max. We have a question from uh, Mayang Priyadarshi. Is it that babies who are bradycardic with lower saturations are the most sick and therefore prone to mortality, irrespective of initial FIO? 
Yeah, I agree perfectly with you. Yeah. Uh, you have always to take into consideration that we don't exactly know what has happened in utero. We see a baby in front of us that is bradycardic and hypoxemic. As you know from the studies of TOS that were done with monkeys many, many years ago, the time of the primary apnea to the secondary apnea reflects the intensity of anoxia. So if a baby, once you start ventilating with a good technique or intubating and ventilating, you do it with a good technique and you are giving uh, the proper amount of oxygen, if he doesn't react, probably he's in the secondary apnea. He has been a long time in anoxia, probably in utero. And this is when a uh, damage can can be caused and it's not a fault of a, a, a bad resuscitation procedure okay the problem is when a baby is born with a short period of anoxia <coughs> excuse me and we don't resuscitate correctly because we don't titrate or we don't ventilate adequately and this is we are causing a delay in normalization okay Thank you, Max. Dr. Nalini Khan, you have more questions there? Thank you, Professor Maximo, for the presentation on clarifying so many practical issues on oxygen units used in the early phase of units. So a few of the questions I'm taking from the chat box here. A specific question came in the chat box regarding the practice of oxygenation. Is it different in delayed cord clamping or in the early clamping? If we are giving oxygen, in the delayed cord clamping group, is it uh, harmful to the brain more in comparison to the early clamping group? And is there evidence for so? Okay, yeah, this is an interesting question because yeah, what our study has shown is in normal babies. We, are, we, are, we have performed this study in term babies. We wanted to know what happens to the oxygenation in normal babies. And what we see is that there is a, a, a faster stabilization of oxygen and heart rate when you leave the court patent, okay? If you are, if you are in a, with, if you're having an asphyxiated baby, you are having an advantage is that if you oxygenate and you have a better pulmonary flow you are going to achieve better oxygenation more rapidly. And you are going to keep the hemodynamics of the brain circulation and the general circulation under better conditions. And this is going to allow you to, in, to enhance resuscitation. However, however, there, th this is all theoretical. We, we don't have yet enough, enough uh, experience a randomized controlled trials with enough experience and enough number of babies with delayed cord clamping. And we cannot compare both. But the studies that are going on with preterm babies, what they show is that at least, at least is equal. But we don't we cannot say that it's better yet. Although in experimental studies it seems to be better. But you know that sometimes the ship and the men are not the same. The same. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the question. And I will take another question from here, the question session by Dr. Kalyan Bala. So why the babies with congenital heart disease tolerate hypoxia and low saturations well over prolonged periods? However, even short periods of hypoxia are not tolerated at all, any periods in babies of normal hearts. Why is it that? Okay. This is a question that hasn't been answered yet, <laughs> but we have published a paper one day ago, <laughs> one day ago in which we did metabolomics of babies that were born with transposition of the great arteries with profound hypoxemia. And when they were, they were submitted to a atrial septostomy, balloon atrial septostomy in order to mix the blood and increase SpO2, and we did metabolomics after serial metabolomics afterwards. 
what happens is that mitochondria in these babies are adapted to low oxygen concentrations and they are storing the synthesis of proteins. So the, all the energy goes into keeping the cells alive, but there is little synthesis of proteins. Once you they do the septostomy, all the metabolism switches into a normal metabolism. And then the babies start synthesizing proteins and you know, behaving like a normal baby. If you would go back to 70% saturation in these babies that have already done the switch, they would die. They cannot go back to the previous situation, okay? I hope I have explained. Thank you. Thank you for explaining uh, things with clarity. So just uh, the extension of this question, again, I'm taking the privilege to ask the question, uh, Dr. Eugene's question here, Professor, whatever the fetus and neonates with the cyanotic congenital heart disease, how the oxygen target should be modified in the first few minutes of life during resuscitation, those cyanotic heart disease, if we know before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it, this is very difficult to answer. I don't. I, I cannot. I cannot give you. I would. I would specially take care of the heart rate and second of the neurological response. If the babies are active, are crying, are are moving, have a good tone and a good response, although they are with low saturation, I would not try to give much more oxygen because you are not going to do any benefit because if the heart is a, has a congenital malformation, despite all the oxygen you give, you don't increase SpO2 and you are causing damage to the lungs and to other structures by giving too much oxygen. Thank you again. But another, another question comes about therapeutics here by Dr. Rajat Atreya. The scope of antioxidant therapy, if at all we can reliably measure oxygen free radicals, Will those be something that need to be looked at? Scope of antioxidant therapy. Yeah, the problem we have had until now with, with the determination of free radical is that if you want to have reliable data, you need a complex system, which is mass spectrometry coupled to liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, capillary electrophoresis. So it's only a complex complex devices that need to be managed by experts. I have uh, three chemists in my group. So, so it's, uh, it's uh, uh, not uh, applicable to the clinical setting. However, however, once we have detected the metabolites that are more relevant and uh, more informative, our next step will be to do an ELISA method or a method, a, a simple method that allows the clinician, like you do the glucose test, to do this test with a simple method. This will be the next. But we are trying to identify which, because we have hundreds of metabolites, which metabolites are the most relevant ones and which me metabolites really reflect what's going on, you know? and have a clinical value. Once we have done this, then the next step is to do a simple clinical method that allows you when you are ventilating with a ventilator giving oxygen or you are doing nitric oxide or anything that you are doing, you can, you can monitor this as you monitor glucose, pH or other things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I will request uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Hagram, to go for, uh, take further few questions and uh, Max, uh, Max, I have a question. Are there any studies on uh, cerebral oxygenation in the transition period with reference to hypoxia and hyperoxia? Yeah, we have uh, the, 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 the group of Dr. Urlesperger in, in Austria has published a lot of papers using NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy. Eh? And he has done also a nomogram of how a uh, near of how a uh, oxy cerebral oxygenation and the fraction of extraction of oxygen behave in the fetal to neonatal transition in term and preterm babies. Yeah, 
And we are doing it also now. We are also incorporating NIRS to our studies in the delivery room. Thank you, Max. We have a question from Dr. Amish Vora. What is your practice in your unit? How much FIO2 do you give in babies who are term, preterm, or extremely preterm? How much okay. do you start with? Yeah. In term, in term and late preterm, we start with 21. In between 28 and 32 weeks, we start with 30. And below 28 weeks, we start with 40. Another question from uh, Liebert Mamani. What results can resuscitation have with the card intact and with uh, what FIO2 would it start in these cases? I think you already answered this yeah, yeah. in your uh, lecture. Yeah. Any more questions, Dr. Nalini Khan? Yeah, it's an interesting question about a subgroup of babies. IUGR with prematurity makes it more vulnerable to the initial gradient hypoxia. And particularly in those groups, what should be best practice to resuscitate them by Dr. Asish Jain? So it's an interesting question in particular this subset. Yeah, I don't think in these babies, uh, the technique of resuscitation changes. We should be aware in these babies uh, that perhaps we have to change our strategy more rapidly than in, in the other babies because the response probably will be worse if we, if we don't change the, the, the strategy. For example, in regarding oxygen, perhaps in a preterm baby that it's uh, 32 weeks, you start with 30%, you go up to 40, then the baby reaches a plateau, good heart rate, and then goes, uh, you know, you go down to 30 and perhaps you can go out of the delivery room with 21, 25 or so. The same weight for an undernourished baby, probably you will have to keep, to go up to 50 to stabilize him and to keep 50 for more time. So you don't have, you have to, to, to act depending on the response of the patient. But being undernourished, what tells you is that you have to be being a, very careful and perhaps leave this baby to the more experienced resuscitator because titrating in the delivery room is not easy. And these babies are more prone to have complications. So uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that if you are undernourished, you start with higher or with lower. It's that you have to adjust your resuscitation more rapidly. We have a practical question from Dr. Vendagopal. How quickly do we escalate oxygen concentration to achieve the target uh, saturation of 85% plus? Yeah, let's say, <clears throat> yeah, well, there are so many possibilities that I have to put also always an example. Let's see that you have a baby who is 28 weeks and you start with 30% and you start resuscitation. When the baby is two minutes, usually you should have information of SpO2 at least two minutes in a, in, a, in a delivery room where you have a good equip, equipment and where you have trained personnel, uh, more than two minutes, you shouldn't wait to have SpO2. And your SpO2 at two minutes is 70, 75. You are sure that you are not going to reach 80% at three minutes. Then you should go into 50 or 60%. So you should increase in doubling the amount of oxygen, and then see how the baby uh, responds. Okay, so the, the question would be answered saying that once you have the SpO2 and the heart rate uh, monitored, you should expect in one, two minutes to double the, 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 the FiO2 if you don't achieve a good response. Uh Infants of diabetic mothers already have some degree of uh, polycythemia. In case uh, delayed car clamping is followed, what will be the impact on uh, saturation and uh, how do you titrate oxygen under those circumstances? If yeah, well, if you have, if you have uh, a polycythemia, then you have more red cells and you don't have to care that much about having higher saturations because 
if you are you you are transporting enough oxygen then the the saturation is not that important you should you should be aware of that you don't you don't need you perhaps between 80 and 85 with if you have a, a polycythemia of 60 percent a, 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 a hematocrit then perhaps with 80 percent you are giving enough oxygen thank you max Anymore? i hate to interrupt uh, can i ask uh, professor max uh, how long can we go on uh, because <laughs> I, i know you are tied up with another uh, e even so how you have to tell us because the questions are too many so you have to tell us when to stop yeah you, you go ahead and i tell you <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you please one, carry on one clinical side from uh, clinical question from my side uh, during presentation i learned that the apgar score in the first one minute may be different it's not 10 it may be 8 or 9 because no babies by 1 to 2 minutes are pink so it do we have any clinical implication for that if a in the normal low apgar should be 8 or 9 should be normal yeah i think that when i see 10 10 in an apgar score i don't believe it <laughs> i mean uh, the apgar score was uh, as you show there was this very interesting study done by dr o'donnell in which we, he showed videos of babies with different colors and experts should say what saturation do you think he has or what apgar score and there was a lot of people that uh, committed errors when interpreting the color of the baby it doesn't matter if the baby has 8 or 10 this this is normal what you should avoid is to give oxygen because you want the baby to be pink and show the the parents a pink baby and sometimes you know that especially in the private practice babies are you know given oxygen so they look pink and the baby father parents like it better so what what i think is that a one minute apgar score the most relevant data in one minute is heart rate if the heart rate is okay then all the other things can be solved but if the heart rate is, is is you know is very bradycardic then you are in trouble we have a question from dr satya prakash why does the neonate require a significantly higher spo2 as compared to the fetus even at 10 minutes of life well uh, the uh, i i explain you because the fetus receives the the oxygen through the intervillous space from the mother so uh, the intervillous space gets the oxygen from the artery, the umbilical artery so there is uh, as long uh, when you go more and more away from the arteries the partial pressure of oxygen gets reduced so you have in your cells you have a 1% saturation and so when you are having a umbilical artery has a partial pressure a saturation of 99 but then you go to the intervillous space to the maternal side you have 60 so the baby gets only 50 or 40 okay and if you go farther and farther every time less oxygen reaches the farthest places away from the umbilical artery so that's why the oxygen in the fetus is lower than in the in the mother thank you max any more questions uh, you have dr nalini khan so have we come to the end of uh, the question uh, session we are in end of the question session uh, so probably well answer all the questions now thank you professor maximum for answering patiently after the presentations one can i ask a just message what i understood presentation just for our clarity in understanding we from the nrp guidelines less than 35 weeks the guidelines age 21 to 30 but with a presentation clearly says here less than 28 weeks the mortality higher so can i take a message from here if a bradycardic baby of less than 28 weeks better to start 30 rather than 21 if a yeah. stable less than 21 start 21 tighter upwards to 30 can i get get that clear message in the presentation yeah i i i i, I am have a clear message and in babies of 24 25 20 26 weeks if they are correctly ventilated 
because one thing is that you think that the, he needs more oxygen and the problem is that the mask is not correctly in, in position. So this is something before, before when we have done some studies with a respiratory function monitor in the delivery room, and sometimes just by moving a little bit the mask, everything gets normal. So it was a malposition of the mask, what happened. But if, if you are doing things correctly or in, the baby is correctly intubated, yeah, the lower the gestational age, the higher the initial FiO2 should be, and afterwards rapidly titrating, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it was my pleasure to be with all of you in the distance. So, so uh, <laughs> I hope to see you soon again. Ye yes, no, yes, Professor Max. Face, face uh, to face, face to face. Face to face, hopefully in March when we have the physical conference. Thank you so much for confirming your presence and uh, travel regulations permitting. And uh, we hope to uh, meet you in person to share um, and uh, learn more from you. So it was a wonderful uh, talk of yours. As usual, the words don't uh, suffice. Uh, the amount of uh, information that has been conveyed with very clear messages uh, right from the uh, oxygenation uh, targets that you should be targeting and what should be the philosophy behind ta target, uh, targeting those uh, values and uh, uh, on to the uh, go, going on to the metabolomics and uh, things like that so thank you so much Prof, uh, professor max it was so kind of you to spend uh, the, so much of your valuable time for us today we are at, um, uh, truly grateful to you thank you thank you all thank you thank very you. much it was my pleasure we are bye welcome. Bye. And at the same time, I would also like to uh, thank two of the uh, eminent neonatologists, uh, Dr. Hariram and Dr. Nalnigand, who have moderated today's session so well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both of you. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Max. And at the end, I mean, and, and before we conclude, uh, uh, I would I have two pleasant, very pleasant tasks. One is to thank all of you from. I mean, we have uh, quite a large number of attendees from all over the globe attending the session. So we are the, the, really thankful to all, all of you for encouraging us with the session, supporting us. Right now, it's almost nearing one and a half years of this uh, series, and you are with us all throughout and then watching in various uh, pla uh, platforms like Zoom, YouTube, Facebook and all that. So it is so nice of you to be with us. We uh, request all of you to continue to support us and uh, uh, let's have a journey of education together and uh, join us if possible physically in the, uh, the uh, physical conference IAP Neocon National uh, IAP Neocon uh, scheduled from 10th to 13th March 2022. Uh, at the same time, I would also invite you uh, all for the next session in our series. Uh, th that is on a totally different topic, that is on nutrition. And we have another legend, Professor Nina Modi from Imperial College London, who is going to take us through some very basic concepts uh, on to the recent advances in uh, feeding a preterm baby. So until then, uh, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night.